be done, Jeff, and it can be done on six meters. It can really be done on anything. Um, Mark, if you want to show the simple layout over here, we'll, we'll go through this. What we're going to do is we're going to take an SDR play with a, a bandpass filter. That bandpass filter is going to be between the antenna and the SDR play. That's really just to isolate the unit so that it's not getting overloaded by other things. This one happens to be at 50 to 51 megahertz. I'm a six meter junkie. I love six meters. It is, as everybody says, the magic band, and it truly is. We're going to take an SDR console, which is connected to the SDR play, and we're going to take go into a computer through a sound card. And this is basically the same thing that you would have for a uh, signal link USB, except this one's made by Masters Communications, into the computer. And then the computer, depending on which mode you're going to run, we're going to do FT8 or um, MSK, Meteor Scatter. I'm only going to do two here in this example, but you can do as many as you want. In the summer, when the bands get to hopping, I do as many as seven at one time. Take seven outputs from your uh, SDR console simultaneously and patch them into um, seven different versions of WSJT. One of the things that you're gonna run into, this is a 1920 by 1080 display. There's not enough screen real estate to put seven copies of WSJT running at the same time on that screen. I simply did it because I got a little gotcha and this is not in the presentation. This is Windows 10. Windows 11 is on my presentation laptop and I was hoping to do that all at once. Windows 11 will not run the OmniRig controller that allows the SDR to control the transceiver. So I had to have another computer. It's a little more clumsy the way we're gonna do it. All right, so a simple way to do this, I'm gonna show you the block diagram. I'm gonna show you the software tools that we're gonna to use to make this work. I'm gonna show, we showed you the hardware very briefly, how to set it up and how to make S, uh, WSJT operate properly. Too far. This thing is pretty pretty quick. The block diagram for this is in the upper left of this picture, antenna switch box, which is homebrew, completely set up, got three BNCs on it. It's got a push to talk and a, and a 12 volts. It's basically a poor man sequencer. It takes the unterminated receiver when it's into the transmitter and puts a, uh, puts a dummy load on it to keep the transmitter from overloading the receiver and blowing up the SDR. You saw the bandpass filter. This one is from antennas and amplifiers in the Czech Republic. It's a fairly inexpensive, fairly small six meter filter. Um, it has about a 10th of a dB of loss or insertion loss in that filter. So it makes it really good for the weak signal stuff on six meters. I'm, a, I'm definitely a weak signal junkie when it comes to that. Feed that into an SDR. I use the SDR play because it can hear down to a minus 141 without external uh, preamplification. In this, you need to have a rig that can be controlled from serial or USB with the software so that it can actually manage what transmit and receive frequency this is gonna be on. So it can be really any rig, doesn't matter what it is, as long as OmniRig supports it. And OmniRig is a free piece of software that we'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, pass it into a sound card. And that sound card is simply to do transmit audio in this, the way we have this set up. The only thing that the IC756 sitting there is going to do is transmit your signal on your chosen band in your chosen mode. And then you have to, piece, have, to have a PC that's A, capable of running uh, SDR console, which can be a real pig, 
This happens to be an I3. That's another reason that I only chose to use two slices because as I go more, it really get ta gets taxing on the hardware. Um, so what do we have to do? You need to have WSJT so that it will work directly on your radio first. That's the first thing you want it to be able to do. You need to be able to have a conversation on FT8 and make it work standalone with your radio. You need to have a driver loaded and the, what do they call it? The software, the, the kit that allows you to, what do they call those? The SDK, you have to have the SDK loaded for the chosen driver so that the SDR console can talk to it. I use VB audio cable, which is a fairly inexpensive thing that allows you to take computer audio and patch it back into the computer on another port so that you can feed those separately. We're using two versions of it, A and B, so that we can run two separate versions of WSJT on two separate audio patches. It's the, the two port is free. If you go more than two ports, you have to donate them at least 15 bucks. I have had as many as eight running. Works great, worth the 15 bucks. Uh, OmniRig is another free piece of software from DX Atlas. You can just go out and grab it, um, install it, configure it for your radio. What that does is it gives multi-user capability to the rig control talking to your radio. So you can have six, eight, 10, whatever it happens to be versions of WSJT running at the same time talking to one instance of OmniRig controlling your radio. At the same time, you can have up to four rigs on OmniRig running at the same time. You could actually force four different radios to do four different things. It's, it gets to be kind of a nightmare to keep all of the, the configuration straight. So you build them one at a time, just keep adding as you go. Don't try to do this all at once because you will end up having less air than I do. So to configure WSJT, that's the first thing to start. Every instance that you start of WSJT has to have a different rig name. And that's a command line switch. If you notice the window on the right side of the page here, under the target, what you're going to do is you're going to append dash dash rig dash name equals, and then a name. That name is to simply make sure that this version that's running of WSJT is known as something else. I generally name it the same as what I'm going to do. In this case, you see that the option is FT4. That FT4 can be whatever. It can be just a random name for you to know what it's connected to. What I generally do is WSJT creates a copy of the icon. I right click that icon, copy, and then paste on the desktop go in and change the target and add that to it. In my version here that we're running, I have two. I have F FT8 and MSK144. That's the two icons that show on the desktop. That is what they're going to be doing when we're done. Come on. And now, there we go. Hardware needed. The first thing you have to have, have WSJT working on your radio, have a working rig control interface. A single rig needs a single control so that you can control the frequency and whatever's happening on that radio. Uh, you need to have a working SDR. The NOELEC is fine. The SDR play is fine. The NOELEC is going to take a preamp in order to work. Uh, the SDR play doesn't require that preamp. It's pretty, pretty hot. You have to have a working antenna that works for uh, your band. You have to have the antenna switch. This antenna switch that we have here, this unit, is a unit that was made by Paul N2EME on the East Coast. It gives a little bit of uh, rig switching and 
it has the, the dummy load protection on the receiver when it goes into transmit so it doesn't blow the unit up. I think he wants 125 bucks for it with, with shipping. So it's fairly inexpensive, it works well, and it will pretty much interface to anything up to about 500 watts. I would not use that box for anything more. You'll have to build one out of a bit more substantial parts if you're going to do that. I generally don't run more than 100 watts when I'm doing this with multiple receivers anyway. So the SDR console, what you're seeing here is the window that I've turned two receivers on. Uh, the left window is 50.26 and the right window is 50.313, which is in order that's meteor scatter and then FT8 on six meters. Uh, getting it set up in this configuration, if you're gonna go into the view and then there's an option for matrix, if you double click the line at the top of the window, it'll dock it like you see here. It's kind of, uh, kind of goofy to do it the first time. What you should do is sit there and play with SDR console for a while, you will get used to it. Um, and then once you get it set up, we'll go over to uh, the demo here in just a bit and I'll walk you through how to actually do it. So once you have all of the pieces set up and working, you've got SDR console running. What you have to do is set it up to operate with an external radio. If you don't see external radio in the left ribbon under um, SDR console, if you'll notice on this picture on the left-hand side, below the mode buttons, there should be a button there that says external radio. If it's not, you have to go to view, look for the dots that says select, click on that, and then click the checkbox next to external radio. Then it will show up in the left console. Once that's done, you'll have to get your audio set up properly. In this case, we do use VB audio cable. Um, each VB audio cable that you load will patch one receiver to one version of WSJT. And you kind of have to keep it in the back of your mind which one does what. I try to do it in such a way that it goes A, B, C, D on the display. So whatever you have it set up for, keep it in order. Or it's just going to get difficult to patch. Um, the pull down in the right below the frequency 50.260 is where you change which receiver patch you're going to use. In this case, 50.260 is patched to cable A. It's a simple pull down. You pull it down, change which one it's going to go to. You're going to do exactly the same thing for the second receiver pane, but you're going to send it to cable B. When you set up your WSJT instance, you're going to go into settings and you're going to go into audio. In this case, each of them are going to have different audio settings. The sound card input is going to be the cable that is set up for your particular function. In this case, A is going to be meteor scatter, MSK144 and 50.260. The same option for FT8, you're going to use cable B in the input. The output is always going to be the sound card. The output goes to the radio. So you have to remember to make sure that the output goes to where it should. And you're not gonna have a VB audio cable for the transmitter. It's gonna be direct to the sound card. So you're kind of splitting SDR for the receive side and radio for the transmit side on the signal link or whatever you're going to use. Then it's up to OmniRig. OmniRig is actually very easy to use. It's a little program that WSJT or the SDR console will call. Go grab it from DX Atlas slash OmniRig, install it, figure out what COM port your radio is on, figure out what speed it's communicating on. If you've made this work with WSJT standalone, you should know those settings. I'm sure you guys have tried to do this on 
uh, a single instance, it's very straightforward. Put those configuration items into OmniRig, go into uh, WSJT under uh, settings, under the radio, pick OmniRig out of the list. If you click on test cat, it should show you immediately that it's working. If it doesn't work, then you probably have either a COM port or a baud rate set wrong. Just make sure it works on WSJT first. Now, for all of you Windows 11 guys, this is kind of a problem. This happens to be a Windows 11 laptop, and I spent almost three hours beating on OmniRig trying to get it to work. OmniRig will not talk to the rig. It'll do it perfectly from WSJT. It will not do it from SDR console. I don't know why. So I gave up and I ended up having to use a Windows 10 computer to do this. I'm hoping that those folks figure it out because I would sure like to be able to use one machine to do it instead of having to bring up another one. Once you get that all set up, it's pretty easy at that point to turn on the external radio. If you'll notice in uh, the upper right hand corner of the frequency box that you see on the screen here, the yellow frequency box where it says 50.127.700, there's a little question mark in the black ribbon right above it. If you click on that, that will give you the ability to set up OmniRig to talk to your radio. Once you're done with that, there's a little play button in the left hand side, just to the left of track that turns it on. When you click on track, it will follow SDR console. That's what you want it to do. And we're just about to get to the point where I'm gonna show you that, but this device here is the bandpass filter and it kind of keeps a lot of the extraneous noise out of your SDR. Because the six meter stuff is so weak signal, you need a very low loss filter. And this one is about a 10th of a dB of insertion loss, which is really pretty good. And I, I actually checked it. <laughs> I was surprised, but it, it works and it works very well. It keeps a lot of the extraneous garbage out. So the next thing is set up your receivers with the frequency that you want. You're about to see the way we have it set up here. I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, if you guys wanna to switch to the other computer here, we're gonna to go to that. And you can look over my shoulder. You guys should be able to see it up on the screen here too. I think you're gonna put it up there. So as soon as I find my cursor here, what we have is on the left side of the screen is, uh, you wanna go away from it and back to it because I have no motion up on the screen. What is it doing? Did it disconnect itself? My cursor is not moving, nothing's moving. Let me see if I can check the... I may not be sending that again. Yeah, I'm gonna restart it here. Do you see it now? Yeah. It's, it's running. It's a little jerky, but it's running. Okay, there we go. It's settled down. So what we have, left side, this is the frequency that the first slice right here is on. And then the right side is the second frequency, which is the FT8 frequency. If you'll notice at the top of the screen, there are mute buttons and then a select button for the receiver that you're not on. The select button for the receiver that you're not on, if you click on that, 
it will actually change the slice that's passing audio. And you'll notice on the right-hand side, the two versions of FT8, the upper one, or WSJTX is FT8, the lower one is MSK144. As we change slices, like in this case, I'm going to switch to MSK144, you'll notice that the frequency on WSJT follows the frequency that the SDR is on. There's a box right below the frequency in the upper left-hand corner, and that is the audio cables for each of the outputs. In this case, left-hand side 50.26 is on cable A. We go to the right side, it's set to cable B. That is conversely set over here in settings for whichever one we happen to be connected to under audio. 50.313 is on cable B. 50.260 is on cable A. Once those are set up, regardless of what is happening on either radio, that receive audio is being patched directly to the corresponding FT8. They operate just like FT8 you're, you're used to or MSK. The WSJT doesn't care where it's coming from and it's listening for the audio stream constantly off of each of those. You can see where this can be a real juggling act to try to do more than two. And it, you really run out of screen real estate because those windows are as small as they can get. Once you get that set up, the screen itself is controlled by this module right here this 50.313 in the big yellow window, it shows down at the bottom of it, IC756 Pro 3 online. And in this case, the receiver or the transmitter is actually going to track whatever frequency you're on. You'll notice if you can see, Willem, can you come in a little bit on this? As you pick the slice, it will change the actual frequency that the rig is on. In this case, we're on the slice for FT8 and it's on 50.313. That's real time, it tracks whatever you are. So if you wanna answer somebody, you have to make sure you click the select button for the mode that you're going to use. Now, if you click in the window, it's gonna change the frequency that the receiver is on. So, I'm going to click here on this waterfall accidentally, and it's going to change my center frequency. You have to be really careful not to click in the window. Click on the select button, not the window. It really takes a little bit of time to get used to, and there's no way to lock the frequency. Now, another little gotcha that you're going to have here, if you look at uh, the system here, let me see if I can find it right here. Sometimes, receivers will get muted. You see where the second receiver here is muted? You have to unmute all. If you're not patching audio all the time to your WSJT instance, it's a waste of time. You need to have audio coming out of the receivers all of the time, passing audio to WSJT so it can constantly decode what's coming in. The only time you're not going to hear audio is when you're in transmit because it's actually going to dump your SDR to a dummy load. Very important to remember. It's kind of a juggling act to get all these pieces doing what they're supposed to do. Now remember, I'm doing this on six meters. You can do this on any frequency, it doesn't matter. This, this SDR play works just fine on HF, works just fine on six meters, works just fine on VHF. Doesn't care what you're doing with it. It hears just as well on HF as it does on six meters. Now I've done it on 20 meters with FT8 and FT4 at the same time so that you're not missing calls. This is really good for contesters that are trying to do multiple modes at the same time with few people. It's very good for that, but you can also tell that it's gonna get pretty busy with a whole lot of clicking to get back and forth between bands. You're, this is set to a one megahertz window. So you can have everything from 50 
to 51 megahertz. So anything that's inside that window, it can do. This unit can do more than that. It can do up to five, but you're going to need a much faster computer than I have here with this i3 to do that. No, no, no. What you're seeing right there is you're seeing the transmit frequency. That's the frequency that the transmitter is on. Because the two, if you look at the window on the left hand side here, um, right here, this is the receive frequency. And this is the receive frequency for the second slice. It never changes. The only thing that you're seeing change is when I click on select here, there's a little bit of a spongy delay here. Um, when I click on select, that's the transmit frequency for the pain that you're in. It's not changing your receive frequency at all. Your receive frequency tracks all the time with what's in that window. Now, because I changed the slice here, I'm gonna put it back. So both of them are on their appropriate frequencies. The left window being 50.26, the right window being 50.313. Those never change. Those can be set for whatever you want inside the passband of the receiver. Since it's grabbing a megahertz wide, you can do everything on six meters with that window, no problem. Like 50.318 is the FT4 frequency. I can add a receiver just as easy. And once I add a receiver, I can add another window here and put it on 50.318. And what I would need to do is add another VB audio cable over here and patch that audio to a third receiver and then take that and patch that to another copy of WSJT. It takes another instance of VB audio cable, no big deal. You buy the package once, you get as many audio cables as you want. And it makes contesting on the digital modes a lot easier, especially if you're using one piece of software. You're not limited to just WSJT. Um, JTDX works very well with this. Um, Ham Radio Deluxe works very well with this a lot of the different uh, different modes that are out there. It's no problem, this will do it very happily as long as you're in a one megahertz window or you have a computer fast enough to deal with it. I've tried it between uh, multiple bands on HF and you can do it. It's a stretch for some computers. You really need something pretty quick to do it. But it makes operating multiple modes at the same time, especially like when it gets to be springtime and you're doing six meters, um, having the ability to be on multiple frequencies at the same time is very valuable because you really never know where they're going to be. I love meteor scatter. It's a lot of fun. But a lot of times when you're doing meteor scatter, the six meter bands might be open on FT8 or FT4, and you really want to be there at the same time. This way you can do it. Um, I'm a big fan when you're doing weak signal things of the SDR play. Um, it is not cheap. That, that unit's about 300 bucks. But if you're thinking about having extra receivers, extra preamplifiers needed, um, this unit has two receivers in it. You could actually patch it to two different frequencies and split this up and do it again on another complete band, however you wanted to do it. It really doesn't matter. A um, lot of fun to try to pull this off. Um, I've learned a lot about resources and computers and the fact that an I3 is pretty anemic. Um, I've also learned that 10th generation I5s are a lot speedier than my 7th generation I7s. So if you're trying to get something that's cost effective, a new 10th generation I5 is worth the money. It's way better than 7th and 8th generation, 8th generation I7s. Any, anybody have any questions about how the pieces fit together? Anybody online? Willow? Microphone? Oh, here we go. The audio cables, is that essentially what in Linux we would call a pipe? A pipe? It's a pipe. 
and you have to buy software to get a pipe on Windows? Yes. It's Windows. Understood. <laughs> and I don't know how to do it on a Mac, so your mileage may vary. This software runs just as well on my Mac, and I'm really a Mac guy. I like my Mac. I'm, I'm assuming that if I needed to be able to pipe on a Mac, it can be done fairly easily. Um, Windows, it's painful. It's very painful, but the BB audio cable is simply install it and click. And it's, it's donationware. He'll take as few as five euro and as much as 50. Um, he's pretty easy to deal with and I've bought it. <laughs> I've actually bought it a couple of times because I found it so useful and I use it for a lot of other things. But um, if you guys have questions about how to do this, uh, Front Range Six Meter Group has uh, a YouTube channel and Paul and 2EME has a really nice presentation that he did last summer uh, on how to actually pull this off on a grand scale. And they've used it for some of the expeditions very successfully. So I would encourage you to go take a look at that if you have any questions about it. Anybody online have questions? I have no idea. It's probably the same switch. Do you know how to you call it with a command line switch? Probably. I would bet you just call it with a command line switch. Sure, it's just a command line switch. I just, I just don't know what it is. It's, they're the same version either way. So you just have to call it with the dash dash rig dash name equals parameter. And it should just come up very happily and run. I'm, I don't think that's gonna be any different. I, I've done it on the Mac and it's exactly the same way. Anything else? So, um when you want to reply, I didn't quite follow how it figures out what mode it needs to reply on. It figures out what mode to reply on by you choosing which slice you're going to connect to. So if I'm on Meteor Scatter and you see on Meteor Scatter there, which is the bottom window, if you see the traffic coming in on Meteor Scatter, you need to select the same slice on the SDR with the select button. And because that slice directly talks to the transmitter, as long as you've moved the transmitter to the right frequency, Correct. it'll- Correct. If you forget to move the transmitter to the right frequency, you're going to be not doing much. You're gonna send the wrong mode on the wrong But frequency. also notice that if you're not on, if you're looking to try to use that slice, it's gonna be red if it's on the wrong frequency. So just notice that it shouldn't be red, it should be black. So it's kind of the stop sign, don't use this. And then all you have to do is go to your receiver pane and select the receiver you want to be on. And it will be on the proper frequency with the proper mode, as long as you have them configured in the right window. Now, you can see where this can be very cumbersome once you start getting more receivers and more copies of WSJT. It can be very frustrating, but a little bit of time and a little bit of playing with it goes a long way, learning which buttons you have to push. Yes, it is too complicated. Yes. Well, but I mean, if you have a multi-monitor setup, you can just move yes. all of those other control panels yes. over to the other monitors. Until... I run it on two 4K monitors and there's enough room that it fits perfectly. But all of your receivers needs to be in that one. Well, I guess you can split that over multiple windows, but you can't break it naturally, right? You can't have different windows that you can move around. They have to be in that layout, correct? On, on this, the uh, RTL or the SDR console, you can put those windows in any order you want. Just um, remove the window from that. You can pop them out. Let me show you what you can do. You can pop them out like this if you wanted to move these somewhere else. There's no problem with doing that. Um, and there's also another 
this is kind of the matrix version here. They also make, if I can bring it up here, that's the matrix. You can do a whole bunch more receivers at one time. I've, I've had as many as 10 going at one time. And as long as your computer has the resources, it can pretty much do it. You can't really rearrange the windows, um, but you can rearrange which frequency is in what window. That's no problem. BB audio cables work across machines. No. So you can actually run some instances on another device. No, BB audio cable is only internal. It's, a, it's the internal pipe on the machine. You can't pipe okay. across machines. Never tried to do that. That's that's a little past. Just basic. buy a machine with more cores. Buy a machine with more cores, and more monitor space. Really, you're limited by the monitor space that you're going to have. the The more resolution you're going to have here, the better off you're going to be. But I'm telling you that with my with my bifocal glasses, it's really hard to see when on a 4K display. It's a challenge. So you really have to get, there's a, a fine line between being able to see what it's doing and um, having more stuff. Yeah, computer glasses, binoculars. Yep. 49.9 megahertz. Not many. So one of the things that, one of the things that you're gonna hate about this is every time you click on the display, the frequency moves. You gotta be really careful about that. It's, it's a bit frustrating. All right, anybody else? N6UA is always good for questions. Where is he? Yes, in Longmont. Available at RM Ham Field Day. Yes, this will be at Field Day. And on six meters. Yes. So you would be able to use your obviously your pro three will work without a filter yes but uh you would need that external filter to keep the sdr from overloading and yes. that's enough to keep now if there was another six meter station running that filter wouldn't stand a chance no but it, if it would, it, there's the 20 meters, end of this is on six meters so uh or what's i guess half of six meters is 10 meters or so that's enough to keep the second harmonic um, I have, 10 meters out. I have a the uh, fundamental. I have a tri mode station running at my house. It's 100 watts on 10 meters. And it does just fine with that filter. I have not, I've not noticed any overload between okay. any of the HF bands running up there in this. So this would be, as Ben pointed out, you need some filtering on it. That is enough. You have to have filtering on it, and it is enough. If you if you want to run this at at uh, field day or in any situation where you've got high power RF, I believe that this filter is good enough. And what's the name of that filter again? This this is made by antennas amplifierscom and I believe that they're in the Czech Republic. Um, they've got bandpass filters for most everything, and they're. I can tell from their page that they're definitely VHF folks. Weak signal VHF. I think VHF. it's saying Serbia. Is it Serbia? I'm not even gonna try to pronounce the city. They were very easy to deal with and the package showed up within a week, which I thought was pretty good. Um, and they take PayPal, so that made it very simple. Uh, I would highly recommend their products. And if you're looking to try to do this on other bands, take a look at what they have or look at other folks out there that are making filters. Like Dean has filters that he's been using for a lot of years for field day. Um, they're very nice. Um, who made those? Oh, they are out of business? Industrial Communications Engineers is the one that Dean's been using. Yeah, I, I would bet DX Engineering probably has some stuff also. The Serbian... Uh... And, uh, filters, they have a 50 to 50, a four megahertz wide. It looks like a one megahertz wide and a two megahertz wide. Which one are you using there, John? This is one megahertz, 50 to 51. The one megahertz, that's 99 euros. Yeah. Uh, it was not, about, not a bad price. It was a little over a hundred bucks. Well worth it. Definitely a good piece of uh, hardware to have if you play weak signal. 
and it even has the bandpass. And I'd highly recommend right the new toy up here. This is the Masters Communications Signal Link replacement. It's called a DRA 100. I got the kit yesterday morning and I had it built within two hours and it works very well. I, I very much like it. It's, it's uh, very quiet, very rock solid. Kitted is the kit. Is it a it's assembled a board or do you have to do component soldering? You have to do about a hundred component soldering and it has one surface mount device already mounted. One. Otherwise everything is leaded. Everything is leaded. So it's very buildable to the. Yeah. Took me about the two new hours. A hundred parts, about two hours. Yeah. It is a master's communications DRA 100. And if you Google that, They've got all sorts of sound card products that are made for um, the Winlink folks, for the weak signal folks, for anybody that does sound card type stuff. I highly recommend them. And if you're doing all star and repeaters, they've got products for that too. Works very well. Um, any questions, comments? What's it the it's it's their version of like the URI, yeah. Their uh, USB radio interface, yeah. It's a sound card on a USB dongle that has a port that comes out the back that you can do CTCSS, push to talk, carrier squelch, uh, whatever you happen to want to do. And uh, very very, Dave Dave Masharovsky WA1JHK who's over here running uh, the system, he uses that for. Uh, the Colorado Repeater Association for a lot of their their uh, links and loves them. And I, I like them significantly better than any of the other devices that we've used in the past. They're very reliable. Okay, I think that's about it. I don't really have anything else. If I know what it is. Oh, yeah, we have on the next RM Ham U, do we know the date? Second Saturday in May. Uh, it's like around the 12th, I think, probably. Uh, we're going to do a presentation on balloons and other things. It's on the 14th. Uh, we'll be back here in the same location. Um, EOSS and Rob Wright, who is our president, is going to be having some of his folks to do a presentation, which was actually scheduled for today, but they have a balloon launch this morning. And they're all out in Eastern Colorado playing with that. But uh, we're gonna do that here. Should be a lot of fun. Um, stuff that I haven't really had any involvement in yet, but it's always nice to learn how this stuff works. But we'd love to have you. Um, we're gonna have the same Zoom that we always have. So you're more than welcome to come there too. And they promised to their launch. Oh yeah, they, are, they promised to actually launch a balloon from here if the wind conditions will allow them to do it. So that would be pretty cool to watch. Might have to go out in the middle of the football field, but we could probably figure that out. All right, well, thank you guys, much appreciated. Um, if you guys have any questions after the fact, my contact information I believe is on the screen right now. Um, don't hesitate to drop me a line. Thank you. <laughs>